going to discuss um, the future of trade for this great country. With us, we have a galaxy uh, uh, of stars, uh, academic and members of parliament, former secretaries of state, and I'm going to introduce them one by one now, then we go straight into the meeting, and then there will be time for discussion and questions. So with us today is David Collins, Professor of International Economic Law at City University and author of Negotiating Brexit, The Legal Basis for EU and Global Trade. And I'm delighted today we're uh, publishing an updated fourth edition of this great work. Uh, next we'll speak, we're we'll welcoming for the second time at Politair, the Right Honourable Theresa Villiers MP. As you know, she was Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and she is the Member of Parliament for Chipping Barnet. Uh, here on my left, making his debut at Politair, is Marcus Fish, who is on the House of Commons International Trade Select Committee and the European Scrutiny Committee. He's also a Member of Parliament for Yogo. Thank you very much for speaking, well, with them, Marcus. And Sir Bill mm -hmm. Cash will join us, <coughs> of course, as we know, he's Chairman of the European Scrutiny Committee. And on my right is Barnabas Reynolds, who is the head of Sherman and Sterling's Financial Institutions and Governance and Advisory Practices. And Barney is the author of four great volumes on future trade for the financial sector for UK EU trade and UK world and global trade. And so Barney, very welcome. I'm delighted you're Proposals were broadly accepted by the Secretary of State and are in the white paper for mutual recognition as a basis for free trade in good services. Now we shall hear more about that basis, potentially for goods. Uh, David Collins. So my perspective is really to dispel this myth that we're constantly being told that a no-deal scenario is something that we should be afraid of or that we're somehow, without a deal, we would crash out of the EU in, in a catastrophic way. We wouldn't, and the simple reason why is that we have the World Trade Organization rules to operate there in the backdrop, and there really isn't any formal procedure that's needed for that other than the ones that have already taken place, and I can tell you with confidence that the UK government has been pursuing its relations as a member of the World Trade Organization. It's just something that you're not really being told in the media. So the World Trade Organization has reduced tariffs on industrialized goods to about 4% on average. So goods already have very, very low tariffs under the rules of the World Trade Organization. This means that the EU would have to offer uh, those low tariffs to us simply by virtue of being another member of the World Trade Organization. It's true that tariffs are somewhat higher on some agricultural products and some manufactured goods like cars, and that, not to, to dismiss that entirely, uh, this is why having a free trade agreement with the EU would be optimal in, in a sense that the WTO option is suboptimal. But, it, but it's not this, this terror that we're, we're led to believe that the sky is going to fall, the economy is going to crash. The other point I want to mention is not just on tariffs, but importantly on these non-tariff barriers. So the other image that I, I've been so keen to dispel whenever I got the opportunity to speak in public or to write about this, is this terror that we have of, of this queue of lorries lined up at Dover that we're some are going to be cut off from the European market because of conformity assessment procedures that will be incompatible. That's simply untrue, at least in the short term, because we have maintained regulatory convergence in the short term with the EU. Day one after Brexit, the regulatory environment in the UK will not be different. This means that the UK cannot arbitrarily impose uh, conformity assessment procedures at the border. To do so would breach WTO law, and I'm talking here about the SPS agreement and the TBT agreement. Now that's not to say that that situation could change as we begin to diverge in a regulatory sense from the EU over time and there could be checks as the divergence increases, but the point is that this will be incremental, it won't be all on day one, and it will only happen to the extent that we do diverge. So this is not something to, to be feared, and that myth needs to be dispelled uh, straight up. Uh, now, again, j just to, to, to be clear on the point, an FTA with the EU would be optimal, uh, especially in relation to services. The WTO environment does not cover services as well. It does cover services, it doesn't cover them as deeply as we would like, and hopefully going forward, 
this is something that the, youth, the UK could take leadership on at the WTO. And indeed, the, the director general of the WTO, Roberto Azevedo, said that he's so happy to have the UK back as an independent country at the WTO negotiating table. And I think the UK will very much push the services agenda going forward. And there's some other things that we would want an FTA from that the WTO is not particularly strong on. The other one is investment. The WTO doesn't cover investment law, and this would be a component of an FTA with Europe if we were to ever get one. Uh, so I would say that the no deal scenario is by no means something to fear, uh, if, but we should be looking for an FTA with the EU, and we should also be looking for FTAs with other countries. We all know this now because it's so much part of the narrative. Of course, one of the great advantages of leaving the EU and leaving the customs union is the ability to sign our own free trade agreements. We sign up to some kind of a customs union or some kind of a weird facilitated customs arrangement where we've made commitments to good alignment on goods. We're going to jeopardize our capacity to sign comprehensive free trade agreements. I'm very worried that the white paper that's been proposed is hinting at, at a carve out for goods. If you've lost the capacity to make uh, negotiations on goods, then you're weakening your bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, FTAs. So FTAs uh, with other countries and with the EU is something they very much want. I think the starting point should be rolling over the 67 FTAs that the EU already had, which we enjoyed it as being as a member of the EU. And it seems quite positively, quite optimistically, a number of countries have said that in fact they're prepared to offer the UK the same terms that they offered the EU. Canada has famously said this, and I heard this directly from the Canadian ambassador to the UK, the Prime Minister of Canada intends to offer the UK an even better deal than what the EU got under CETA. So I don't think that this is something else to be uh, worried about, but, but obviously the work needs to be done, so these agreements need to be rolled over. And then beyond that, we need new FTAs with third countries. And the obvious prize there, the great prize, is an FTA with the United States. And I, I believe this is entirely feasible, and this is something that we should be taking the lead on and preparing the groundwork for, for a, a FTA with, with the U.S. as soon as possible to facilitate those negotiations. But once again, you need the regulatory flexibility, control over your regulations on goods and services, to be able to make bespoke trade agreements with third parties like the, the U.S. and the Commonwealth not being tied to the EU rule book, as it were. So, so we need that, that, that flexibility. Uh, and uh, I think there's, there's no reason why we can't have a great FTA with the EU. Now, it looks unlikely that we're going to get it now by April, but fine, we'll deal on WTO terms for a while, and maybe an FTA with the EU will be forthcoming in the next few years. The EU loves these kind of things. They've done one with Canada. And again, I think we can get a better deal than what CETA was. It can be CETA plus or plus plus, or plus plus plus, depending on what, what uh, you, you want to put into that. The EU has just finished one with Japan. Japan is not taking ECJ jurisdiction. It's not committing to regulatory alignment with the EU. It's not committing to a common external tariff. We can get the same thing as Japan, if not better, because we're already such close trading partners. So I think this is very much something that can be done. If it's done later, fine. We can happily deal with the, the EU on WTO terms for a, a good long time, for the foreseeable future if necessary, and, and deal with the FT, the FTA later if we have to. It would have been nice to have one ready to go for April of next year. If that's not the case, I can live with that. Uh, it, it's just a question of, of getting ready for it, and the UK government is making these preparations. We've got the, the Trade Remedies Authority, which is the, uh, a department of the government that will uh, get the WTO remedies set up. The ports are being uh, readied for, for the customs issue, issues, and uh, we're now hearing that uh, some papers are being put out to help small businesses deal with the, the changes. So I'm optimistic that all will be ready for a WTO scenario April 1st, uh, if the FK is not forthcoming, which it probably isn't. I think I I'll stop there, Sue. So I want to look at some of the key aspects of the white paper. Firstly, this commitment to what they call common rule book for goods and agri-food. The supporters of the white paper point out that this covers only about 20% of our economy, leaving us free to set our own rules in relation to the other 80%. Moreover, many standards are determined at global level and we have to comply with them anyway. 
But on the other hand, the criticism of the white paper points out that it would mean we're not taking back control of our laws in the way that we hoped. <coughs> We'd become a rule taker, and it would be open to the EU to design its rules in a way which would deliberately damage UK producers, and we'd have no vote and no redress. Whilst there may indeed be an element to which EU standards for manufactured goods are indeed based on global agreements, there is little doubt that their rules on food and farming most certainly are not. Um, so that's a first concern. Secondly, the White Paper proposes to retain current standards on environment, social employment, and consumer protection. Now, the government plausibly argue that this makes sense because we're already committed to high standards, so we wouldn't want to change them anyway. I, too, uh, am very much a supporter of high standards in all these areas, including particularly the environment. But I believe strongly that we do need flexibility to adapt to future circumstances. Um, what she didn't tell you in her introduction is I spent six years as a member of the European Parliament. And I was, it's okay. <laughs> Usually I try and hide that. <laughs> but it does make me a veteran of many struggles on new directives, which went through the process when I was an MEP. And I can say with absolute confidence that we in this country can produce regulation that works more effectively, less disruptively, and less expensively than EU rules. And we can do that without compromising the highest standards of protection for the environment or consumer affairs or in the workplace. So my anxiety is that locking ourselves forever to every rule which now applies in these areas would close off quite a significant opportunity to boost our economy by delivering more efficient regulation which is better suited to our local <coughs> circumstances. And it would also make it realistically far more difficult to adapt to future developments in technology, in particular biotech, where the EU has a very different approach to the one that they ever support in the UK. Um, if our commitment on these so-called non-regression clauses related only to outcomes with flexibility about how we achieve them, then this aspect of the white paper becomes much less problematic. But the danger is that any changes we might want to make in future might be viewed by the EU as letting standards fall. And that concern is amplified by a possible role for the European Court of Justice in adjudicating any disputes that might occur on such changes, since that court may well be likely to take a strict approach on interpretation. And that brings me to the third point of dispute between the supporters and the opponents of the Czechs agreements, the role of the ECJ. This is exemplified by the letter to MPs from the new Attorney General in which he asserted that the White Paper involves a fundamental change to the role of the ECJ, an end to its direct jurisdiction, and leaving it only with a residual role based on a voluntary reference by a joint committee on which the UK would be represented. This is contrasted with the opinion offered by Martin Howe, you see, that in practice, reference to the ECJ by the Joint Committee in the case of disputes would be mandatory, its opinion would be binding, and therefore, de facto, we'd still be heavily affected by decisions in the Court of Justice. Except in the Common Rule Book would inevitably involve ECJ jurisdiction in relation to interpreting the EU rules it would contain, <laughs> and the White Paper, though, also envisages that in the negotiation we'll ask the right not to adopt a new EU rule, but acknowledges that that might have consequences. Now, those consequences are not spelled out in the White Paper, they'd be a matter for negotiation. One option might be potential future restrictions on access to EU markets for certain products where we were diverging. That might mean it was genuinely possible for Parliament to exercise a right to reject EU rules. Other possible consequences that might be imposed would be less palatable, including potentially the collapse of an old treaty or the implication of the so-called Northern Ireland backstop, and that would render the right of Parliament to reject new EU rules theoretical rather than valuable. I think that the fourth aspect of the White Paper, on which I want to focus before wrapping up, is the plan for a so-called facilitated customs arrangement. In its favour, it seems that it would allow the UK to negotiate and enter trade agreements with other countries. I also acknowledge that the technological solutions explored as part of the work on the government's former Max Fat proposal 
could be deployed to streamline the FCA process for charging appropriate tariffs and distinguishing goods destined for the EU from those which will stay in the UK, that would hopefully mean that only a small, relatively small proportion of goods would have to interact with the new arrangements. On the other hand, there is no precedent for this anywhere in the world, and even its supporters acknowledge that it would be quite, quite complicated. Um, Others here will provide greater expert insight into this aspect of the white paper, but one of my key concerns is as follows. Firstly, the goods which have been allowed into the UK on the basis of UK rather than EU tariffs would need to be subject to a tracking system. You can imagine that would be a requirement of the EU to prevent leakage into their jurisdiction, and that would add to the complexity. Secondly, there might be a real risk of contravening GATT, which provides that imported goods mustn't be subject to less favourable requirements than domestically produced ones, apart from a tariff imposed the border. Thirdly, there isn't a plan to ask the EU to collect our tariffs on goods coming into their market, destined for our jurisdiction. The government's position on that is, uh, to say the least, not settled, following the uh, <coughs> events of the last few days in Parliament. Um, but fourthly and most significantly, as, um, as Professor Collins has already pointed out, if we're bound by EU rules on goods and agri-food, that significantly limits our ability to secure new trade deals because it would mean applying EU standards to imported goods and prevent us from reaching agreements with new trading partners based on mutual recognition of each other's regulatory systems. Um, and so these, these are all key questions that need to be resolved for this country and our parliament makes a decision on the terms on which we should leave the EU. The White Paper's supporters say there isn't a credible alternative, but DXU produced a White Paper seeking a wide-ranging free trade agreement covering goods and services with mutual recognition of one another's standards as a core principle. It's now there for everyone to see because it's been linked to the Conservative Home website. The government's approach here, I think, is heavily motivated by the belief that the, the EU wouldn't accept a proposal along the lines contained in the DXU version of the White Paper. If we demanded this, the argument runs, the end result would be no deal and no implementation period. And that would involve facing the uncertainty of a sudden exit in just over eight month time and renewed pressure from Remain supporting parliamentarians force us into an EEA type arrangement inside the customs union and inside the single market. But putting the other into perspective, most, as we've heard today, most world trade takes place on world trade organisation terms. If leaving on world trade organisation does come with some initial disruption, that would only occur if the EU deliberately tried to be obstructive and arguably they might find themselves in contravention of some of their obligations under the WTA. Not least is the 2017 Trade Facilitation Agreement, which requires its signatories to cooperate in relation to customs checks at borders. Physical checks at borders are becoming less and less relevant with countries around the world switching to remote checks and trusted trade schemes. Um, but I think the, the key problem, which is at the forefront of the government's reasoning here, is how to ensure that we retain an open border in Northern Ireland. Again, looking at the work done by the government on the so-called max pack option, that would, that would mean it's possible to deliver the appropriate compliance customs and rules of origin checks without physical infrastructure at the border. The key sticking point is in addition to that, you would probably need an exemption for small local traders. It's difficult to see how they could be accommodated within the various technological solutions. Um, that is something which I think is going to be at the heart of the discussions in Brussels and also the debate in Parliament on the government's white paper. And I look forward to hearing your perspectives on the issues that I've raised. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by associating myself with the excellent comments of my uh, two uh, previous speakers. Um, I think it's worth uh, just stepping back a bit and just uh, thinking about the uh, decision that the people made back in June of 2016. Their decision was to leave the EU. And from their perspective, I believe, 
they will take a pretty blunt approach to whether that has or has not actually occurred in their perception. And I think uh, the danger um, of the sort of sophistry that we've been seeing going on about what defines or does not define customs union or single market um, slightly misses the, uh, the, which is not to say anything uh, derogatory about my uh, pre previous speak speakers, it's absolutely right to engage with the detail, that's absolutely correct. This is a the devil is in the detail with these things, but in my view, the public has already been pretty clear when I've been speaking to them on the doorstep of Yeovil, for example, last weekend, that uh, the facilitated customs arrangement smells to them like a customs union staying in the EU, as does the idea that we would be subject to a common rulebook. They say, well, what's different to being in the EU? Um, when, when, when you're subject to the EU's rules. And I think you know, we need to focus on leaving the EU as the measure of whether we've been successful in, um, in, uh, in carrying out the instructions of the British people or not, rather than getting too wound up in what the potential terms are of some sort of deal. The, 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 the nature of the deal with the EU is actually secondary to that basic imperative to leave the EU. So, um, with that in mind, the sort of political context of recent weeks, I think, has been fascinating in many ways. Um, I was on Newsnight the other night, and uh, uh, Dominic Creed was talking about national crisis, national government, uh, the prospect of him wrecking the parliamentary party system. He said he. He would, he would regret it, but, he, but he'd have to do it if it came to that. Um, you know, extraordinary stuff. Um, and uh, what I tried to say in that interview was that we just at this point need to show some spine. And I think what I meant by that was that there's an obvious way of going about this, which I think for the variety of political reasons that we know about has been um, sidelined. Uh, Theresa mentioned it just now, the fact that deaths you were working on, a, working on a solution to this, which was quite straightforward, and in, in, in fact was one that the EU said in March, uh, Donald Tusk um, said that they were perfectly happy to ne 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 negotiate a free trade agreement with lots of add-ons, uh, uh, specifically in services. Um, to govern our trade, but our trade would be as two separate regulatory jurisdictions. And the advantage of that is it's simple, in that uh, we are two different regulatory jurisdictions, different customs ju jurisdictions. We are not asking the EU to do anything differently to how they do things for other people. Um, so I've been having lots of in-depth conversations with professionals in the customs uh, uh, environment and they have pretty much unanimously been saying to me that the, the tools already exist for the EU to interact with third countries and to make cross-border trade highly efficient so that you don't have to check goods at the border itself. If you have customs agents and clearance systems, then you can really bolt on to what we already do, for example, in Northern Ireland with respect to VAT and excise, which is declarations away from the border it's itself as the main way of making that system work. And so I, I personally feel that this, uh, the uh, political argument that we saw run yesterday by the Shadow Secretary of State for Dexiu Keir Starmer, where, where he said that the, he said in terms that the customs union was the only way of having a frictionless border in Ireland. I just think that that is simply an untruth and it's one that they're trying to get abroad and it's one that we should back back with vigour. Um, so, but I am slightly concerned that the government uh, and number 10 are being badly advised in this and they seem to have gone along with this uh, particular view. They seem to have gone along with the idea um, that there's an economic disaster around the corner as well if, uh, if a customs union and the single market are not pursued. And I think that 
both of those decision making uh, rationales are just simply wrong. Um, and when you look at the ec economic opportunities that are there, from being able to control our own trade, from being able to do things the way we want around the world, I think are of immense value. And I think of immense value as well, which is um, it's hard to quantify, but what, what price is actually the freedom to be able to regulate your own economy? Um, we're in danger of making these decisions on the basis of 12% of, of our economy, which is about EU exports, but what about the 88% of the economy which isn't? And what about the value of that in perpetuity? I mean, it's, it's arguably of infinite value. Um, and that, that comes back to the sovereignty issue that's at its heart. And I just simply do not believe for a minute that the British people will put up with being told that quasi-customs union and quasi-single market is something that is in their interests. Um, so I personally think it also goes against, you know, decades of Conservative Party manifesto commitments to uh, increasing or retaining, at least retaining, our autonomy over our own regulation. That's why we had the arguments about the social chapter. But, but you know, go, go back and look at those documents. It's a real departure if this government thinks that effectively applying again to be a member of the EU but on different terms and on terms that are worse than our current terms in, in terms of regulation and oversight and scrutiny and the ability to uh, resist potentially damaging le legislation. Uh, I think that if the government thinks that that's a good strategy, they've got rocks in their heads. <laughs> um, and, and frankly, I think that the Chequers strategy is the biggest risk to our nation Today, it is the biggest political risk because it is if that policy is pursued, people may well feel that, that that's not what they voted for, and checkers would, in my view, end up meaning Corbyn. Thank you very much. I, I just thought I'd cover the financial services piece of the white paper, um, and the services more generally, where the story is better. Uh, because the white paper seeks to do what, as I understand it, lets you have in mind for goods, uh, which is uh, a mutual recognition arrangement based on outcomes. Uh, and it's, it's workable if pursued subject to the drafting, as I'll explain. Uh, it reflects a template for enhanced equivalents, which are published this year, um, with one exception. Uh, and I'll explain this, but basically, um, the proposal for the independent tribunal to oversee the interpretation of the equivalents has not been adopted, and instead reliance uh, is, is placed um, on the processes and procedures, time periods, and so on. So I think it can be made to work. Um, and so, it, just to sort of go through what, what is proposed, um, a new economic and regulatory arrangement with the EU in financial <coughs> services, with a coordinated approach leading to uh, compatible regulation, preserving regulatory and supervisory cooperation, and maintaining financial stability, market, market integrity, and consumer protection. The arrangements would provide for reciprocal recognition of equivalents under all existing third country regimes, and then fill in the gaps in those regimes, for instance, for lending, the writing of guarantees, financial guarantees, primary insurance, and so on. There aren't that many gaps in the, the EU's interest to fill them in as much as anyone else's. Uh, reflecting global business models and the high degree of economic integration between the UK and the EU. There will be treaty based commitments for procedures, notice periods, and transparency, with agreed processes including the consultation and collaboration. There will be an outcomes based definition, and none of these impinge on sovereignty or any of the issues that are sensitive on the goods front. Um, and it seems to me you could replicate this approach entirely because I don't see why not. Um, it, it is an outcomes-based definition of equivalence based on evidence-based judgments, uh, and we, of course, in drafting that, should ensure that the outcomes are and have to be defined at the highest level of specificity, uh, permitting the necessary uh, flexibility so that neither party is a rule taker, uh, which is so key, as the regulators have said in the UK, uh, to ensure that the regulators can protect against systemic risk and protect against UK taxpayer liability as per what went wrong in 2007 and 2008. 
Uh, there needs to be a declaration, there, uh, a declaration of shared intentions, which um, uh, in the white paper it says, uh, to avoid regulations that produce diversion of incomes in relation to cross-border financial services. That's all fine. Uh, future determinations of equivalence uh, are to be an autonomous matter for each party. As I've mentioned, there's no proposal for the independent tribunal to um, oversee that. Uh, so we need to rely on the definition that's going to be applied to uh, in sufficiently wide. And one could, if necessary, I suppose, take uh, any case to the ECJ, whether if you're in the private sector or the government could, um, uh, for redress on that, or just walk away from, from the relevant chunk of the deal where the behavior uh, is unacceptable. Uh, and for that chunk, and the chunks in financial services are already defined in the existing equivalence regimes, they're pretty discreet. Uh, and the smaller the better for everyone, you can walk away from that chunk and carry on with everything else. There will be common principles for governance um, of the re relationship, extensive supervisory cooperation and dialogue, and predictable and transparent and robust uh, processes. There will be common objectives, um, managing shared interests, financial stability and so on. The overall framework would uh, facilitate collaboration and dialogue, uh, so that each party can uh, uh, work uh, with the other on new proposals, adjustments, uh, and, and things as they come up on a political and technical level. There'd be close supervisory cooperation, but only in relation to firms which pose uh, systemic risk uh, to the other party uh, or provide sig uh, significant cross border services on the basis of equivalence. Uh, and there'd be uh, reciprocal and close cooperation to protect consumers and natural stability uh, and market, market um, integrity. Um, There'd be information exchange, different mechanisms for consultation over decisions affecting the other party, and arrangements for the supervision of market infrastructure, um, but no movement on Europe theory. There'd be transparent processes to ensure the relationship is stable, reliable, and enduring. Processes uh, uh, for assessing equivalence based on a clear and common objectives after consultation with the industry and others, and expert panels being considered. And then a process for withdrawal from a chunk. Uh, where there's an initial period of consultation on solutions, uh, or one can just give notice, uh, there'll be clear timelines, appropriate notice periods, and importantly in paragraph 70B, a safeguard for acquired rights, taking off the table any sort of, of the current concerns over cliff edge uh, contact, uh, contract lack of, lack of continuity of contracts uh, if we walk away from a chunk. I think personally the law is pretty clear on this already, and I've said that out in various papers, uh, but there are people who doubt it, and this we can take that doubt away. There'll be a presumption against any unilateral narrowing in terms of market access, and the independent tribunal would oversee the procedural aspects and general commitments. More generally, the services provisions seem directionally okay to me, based on the mutual recognition in a similar manner, and it's now down to the drafting. It does flag in the white paper that we need to add supplementary provisions for professional and business services because not all the detail is covered. They're right on that. So for instance, for lawyers, uh, there should be mutual recognition of legal professionals' privilege, uh, rights of audience and appearance and so on. On the flanking agreements, so-called, these ancillary agreements on social and uh, employment and other matters, as I see it, that offer, if it stands, uh, is all to do with goods. It's nothing to do with services. Is. If we are to engage in the, the goods deal on offer, then I can sort of see that there might be a necessity to have some element on this point, which the French have argued is social dumping for years. John Major got the opt out, and Tony Blair gave it away for nothing. Uh, personally, I would not have those plenty of agreements because there's a judgment call if we're, if we're getting a deal done, but I don't think they're relevant to services. And it's very, very important that we ensure that services is carved out from any flanking agreement. And I would suggest. But insofar as we walk, walk out of um, a, a, a chapter or, or a chunk of um, EU regulation in the goods sector, the relevant flanking agreement obligations fall away. Why? Do we, do we intend to do anything differently? I don't know, but it's a point of sovereignty, and down the line we need the flexibility, for instance, in the financial services sector, to, tr to, to maintain our competitiveness with New York and elsewhere in a sector where people don't expect some of the protections that are put into the current EU law. Finally, we should be actively and openly planning for a no-deal fallback in financial services, taking counterbalancing measures to enhance the city's competitiveness on the, uh, a no-deal outcome, including contingent tax breaks for EU-facing business on a no-deal outcome, 
Um, looking at, again at our regulatory architecture and making clear that we'll remove red tape and, and EU prescription and rebalance away from the endless rules based approach towards the traditional UK approach of high standards and fewer rules uh, relying on supervisory judgment. We should facilitate solutions in the sector which involve nothing moving at all, including a sort of silver bullet solution, which is where if the EU customers have uh, given to them UK subsidiaries, which are you know, a big four firm or a big uh, organisation that can easily set up for them and run, uh, those subsidiaries can receive the financial service entirely from the UK jurisdiction, and it would be far cheaper for them to receive their financial services that way than to pay indirectly as they will be charged for. Uh, any movement of infrastructure which will be charged back to them through the service. This sort of approach is not only essential now to ensure that we get a good deal and also to, to ensure that we're prepared for a no deal outcome without seepage and causation of system risk. It's also key for us to behave like this and to ensure the city is competitive uh, on an ongoing basis because under this sort of deal there will be an ongoing tussle, if you like, or tension with the EU on new rules where the UK needs to be competitive and in a position to be able to say, well, that's fine if you take that view, you will take a different one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I think we have to raise the game uh, externally uh, in the country, outside the framework of what's been going on inside Parliament. Uh, we have a system of parliamentary government, not government by parliament. And I do think that there is a serious challenge going on at the moment, in fact we can see it it's there every single day, when the parliamentarians, uh, some of whom perhaps don't understand some of the uh, details that have been discussed around this table, uh, although uh, I very much agree, if I may say, uh, not surprisingly, with uh, Marcus on the question of democracy. I made a speech about this yesterday. Uh, um, and I only had seven minutes. Um, I would very much like to have had a little bit more because there are more things that need to be said about respecting and accepting the referendum result. I also believe that the consequences of the direction of checkers, as I said to the Prime Minister on the 2nd of July before checkers, I, I got a whiff of the idea, perhaps it was a sort of sixth sense, that there was going to be an attempt to achieve a legal re-entry, I said, into the European Union. Will she dismiss this? She didn't answer my question except by reference to saying she wouldn't have the EEA. And I said, would she dismiss it? Because the idea was preposterous against the background of the referendum result, and that to go down another route would be effectively undermining trust in democracy. And I think that's where it's beginning to go in the constituencies amongst people, yeah. not just amongst headbangers um, and ranters and all the stuff that they throw at us, swivel-eyed and all the rest of it, but actually about very, very simple things for which people fought and died uh, in the last few uh, um, generations. Uh, we must not forget that democracy is actually only um, effective when it carries with it the consent of the people. And it sounds a sort of obvious thing to say, but when you get into a situation where you have a referendum outcome which was agreed by six to one in the House of Commons, and then there is an attempt to reclaim that decision by parliamentarians who don't like the result that they were faced with when they thought they weren't going to get that result, uh, is playing with fire. <coughs> so that would be my first general proposition. Uh, the second thing is, um, on a more general front, to say that I believe, and by the way, I agree with everything that's been said uh, on the platform, so I don't need to repeat it, just thank you very much for that. Uh, I would simply say, uh, I hear uh, people such as Simon Fraser, um, I think I'd be right in saying, if I'm not misquoting him, uh, that there has been a, a deliberate decision at Chequers to prioritise the EU as against uh, the US and global trade in the broadest sense. I hope I'm not misquoting him, but that's what I thought I heard. And I, I, and I think it is prevalent that some people believe that the EU, which is dysfunctional, people are voting against, their, against it with their feet all over Europe, had they not noticed uh, that effectively the, um, the manner in which the uh, 
it functions uh, is uh, through a council of ministers, which itself uh, proves the reason we had to leave because the decisions are taken, and I'm speaking now as chairman of the European Scrutiny Committee, we did a report on this, and <laughs> I've got friends, three here of us who are on the committee and been on the committee recently. Uh, and they do it behind closed doors by consensus. People simply do not realize how deliberately undemocratic the system actually is. And uh, the decisions are taken um, behind closed doors. There's no transcript of any description. So nobody knows the reasons why people have arrived at the decisions. Uh, furthermore, um, Ken Clark even agreed with me during an exchange when I asked him to deny this, and he said actually it's, it's as bad as, as, as I'd set out. Um, it's impossible on most occasions to find out what the voting would have been. You lose your uh, blocking minority um, uh, effectively because it's done by consensus, and so you get a few crumbs off the table if you're the United Kingdom. We are outvoted more than any other country where there is a vote, and Germany votes against us more often than anybody else when there is a vote. Um, so there is a whole raft of reasons why we have got out of the system. Uh, they are uh, about sovereignty, they're about democracy, they are about lawmaking, they are about the decision of people to make their own decisions in general elections and have those translated into economic policy, including trading around the rest of the world, which you can't do if you're shackled to the EU and the Commission's uh, control over that. Um, much of this has been covered. Uh, but I'd now, if I may, just move on quickly to the actual content of the white paper and, and the, uh, if I, 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 for anyone interested, of course the 90% of all the rest of the growth in the world is going to come from outside the EU. Uh, we used to have 59, 60% of our trade with the EU, it's now 42 and, and decreasing. Uh, as I say, the EU itself is getting close to implosion, um, and it's not a joke because um, the rise of the far right is taking place at the same time. To forgive me, I set all this out in a book I wrote in 1990 uh, called Against the Federal Europe. One last point. The idea that the common rule book, for reasons that Martin Howe set out, but also uh, Badenacker, who is the former EFTA uh, president of the EFTA court, and I made a speech about this yesterday for those who can be bothered to read up. That the best way to keep a secret is to make a speech in the House of Commons. So I'm going to try and uh, bring it out. Um, basically, uh, ECJ jurisdiction will effectively uh, be reimposed. But this is, for me, really crucial. And I put this to the Prime Minister yesterday, and she can't, I don't think, really answer it, and I don't think anybody else can either. The scrutiny process, and I'm just going to explain this because I know we've got to move on, but I really want to explain this. The um, system operates behind closed doors. There will be 27 of them. They will determine the common rule book, and any changes that may take place will be actually determined by the way in which the scrutiny process works within the framework of the EU as is translated into the scrutiny process in the House of Commons. So it is fundamentally undemocratic. It reaches us. International obligations would have been made because it would be done by treaty. I suspect that would be accompanied by acts of parliament which will, which will put a, a statutory stamp on them. The idea that the, uh, when it gets into committee, when it arrives in the House of Commons, um, that the government will then say, well, we made this decision, but now Parliament is going to be able to undo it by voting against it. I think it's completely for the birds. And the whips will, as they do already, actually insist uh, in that members of the committee who will be probably appoint, will be appointed by the whips, uh, they, the committee members will be expected to vote in accordance with what the government has already decided. So I say that this is actually has all the characteristics of parliamentary sovereignty in fiction. And funnily enough, Politaire published, published a, a, a paper by the Prime Minister, which I mentioned yesterday in the House, on, on the floor of the House, in which he actually when she said... When shadow leader of the when House. When she was shadow leader of the House. And uh, chapter five of that pamphlet should be reproduced because it says that actually in practice, 
There isn't any sovereignty when it comes to the EU. And I've got news for you. Under these present arrangements, it's even going to be worse than it was before. We're not going to be at the table. We are not going to be exercising the minuscule influence that we ever existed. We are not going to be in a position to uh, outvote anybody because there won't be any votes that we'll be party to. There will be no docking minority. If the Germans decide to do something and they call the shots, they will get the regulations through. This could expand the degree to which we are currently controlled with a new common rule book in a manner, and I really ask people to study this, because it's going to possibly be even more disadvantageous to us, believe it or not, than it is already. And I, I then said, made a remark, which got a little bit of publicity, and I don't want to point fingers at anyone in particular, but I said two things. I said, I think it's a remarkable achievement uh, to have turned the gold of democracy into a new kind of perverted alchemy, which is to turn the gold of democracy into base metal. And I then added at the end, without pointing the finger at anybody in particular, but you may or may not get my message, uh, that uh, I've heard a rat trying to leave a sinking ship, but I have never yet heard a rat trying to sink a leaving ship. Thank you very much. <laughs>
because this is one of the very precious things in this country. It's something which British people perceive to be their own special political tradition, a democratic tradition which has kept them stable, where uh, people vote in elected representatives. And I, I just refer to what one great political leader, often in fact the Conservative Party, which we led a national government, used to tell his new MPs every single session, remember, it is the people who have put you here, and you are here by their authority, and they will remove you. And I was, uh, I'm very concerned, along with other parliamentarians here, that some members of parliament think their authority seems to come from themselves, no. not from the people they represent. No. And it is that directly which this country has, which is very precious, which can be broken at any instance by bad government or bad parliamentary over overview of itself. So I would just like to commend Bill for bringing that to our attention. We will keep up all these very interesting discussions with the hope of helping our parliamentarians with the expert advice of our lawyers uh, to shadow what's going to go on now for the next six months, to come up with positive and constructive ideas so that Britain can leave as the people want to leave. Thank you.